Hello and welcome to the God's Word Bible study and we'll start with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you Lord for all that you have done and we ask you Lord that you will send your Holy Spirit to teach us and that you will give us the strength, the courage and the determination to do what you have shown us. In the holy name of Jesus Christ, your Son, we pray. Amen. Okay, so today we are continuing our study on the book of James and we are up to James chapter 2 and verse 10. But we'll go back and we'll just reiterate a little of what we did the last time, mainly from verse 8. From James chapter 2, verse 8. Reading. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Okay, and so the question that we had asked about these two verses is, is James saying that we can do both, that we can love and we can show bias, bias favoritism, preference? And he's not. So let's read it again together. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. So James is saying if you do that, you're doing fine. But, if you have respect to person, you commit sin. So, he's juxtaposing these two things against each other. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you can't be a respecter of persons. Because everybody's your neighbors. Exactly. And he said, if you have disrespect, if you have preference, if you have bias, then that's sin. That's a sinful. So, if we are nationalistic, or racist, or classes, or whatever our, our is is, that's a sin. Any kind of bias that is based on preference is a sin. And so James is saying, if we are, if we, if we harbor any of these kind of things in our heart, we by definition cannot be fulfilling the command to love your neighbor. our neighbor as ourselves. Okay. And he says, and if we do this, if we are respecters of persons, meaning that you prefer one person above another, then we are convinced of the law as transgressors. So we are sinners. Now verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not kill. Now... If ye commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. A couple of days ago, I was speaking with some guys in prison, and we were discussing, you know, starting a business and insurance and all of that. And so one of them mentioned that if you're a felon, then your insurance rate is higher because you're viewed as high risk. And I said to them, yes, that's the problem, is that the insurance company isn't looking at the type of crime you commit. They don't care. All they're looking for is felon. And once you're a felon, they treat you as a high-risk person, even if you're not. Because once you have broken the law, you are a criminal. Okay, and this is exactly what James is saying. Once we have broken one commandment, we're guilty of all because we are lawbreakers. Okay, but the, for the Christian, for you and I, the problem isn't breaking the law. Because as Christians, we're only supposed to be living under one law. And it is actually the law that we just, we just discussed, which is, which is the law of love. And the, the law that we as Christians will mainly break if we're living true to God's direction is that when we know to do good and do it not to us, that is sin. That's the law that good, righteous, law-abiding, God-favoring Christians normally commit. Is that we know that we're supposed to do something, and we come up with an excuse. And we, some of the excuses do le look legitimate, but we know that they're just excuses. You know, we might say, oh, the person didn't ask. That's a very common excuse that we have. The person didn't ask. But we know, because even though the person didn't ask, God did. And that's why God directed our awareness to know that the person was in need. So that's our big pitfall. So if you go to James 4 verse 17. <laughs> okay. James 4, 4 verse 17. And verse 
17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Okay, so I, we, we'll deal with this verse in totality when we come to it, but I just want to mention that as Christian, you and I, living our life day to day, under submission to God, this is a sin that normally trips us up. Okay? So let's be aware of that, because if we resist doing the good that God has pointed out to us, that's sin. But for others of us who have been living the Christian life, if we can call it that, that our sin has been basically breaking the Ten Commandments. We're still stealing, we're still lying, we're still committing adultery, all of that. Well, we haven't been delivered, because exactly. that's what Jesus delivered us from. All right, so if, if we're in that group, then we know that we need to go back, fall on our knees, and beg God to deliver us. And he will. We might just have to stay on our knees a little longer. God told us something that also applies to him. He says we shouldn't throw our pearls before swine, lest they trample them and come and tear us to pieces. If God warns us about that, you can rest assured that he feels the same way about giving his Holy Spirit. To those who are unworthy. Right, to the defiled. So sometimes what we have to do is that we have to go on our knees and when we're on our knees and pleading, it's not that we're convincing God. It's actually that we are lining up properly with God. We're convincing ourselves. That's the person who needs convincing. Because the Bible does tell us that God is more willing to give us of the Holy Spirit than we are willing to ask. So the problem for us, why we're still living in sin, is not that God doesn't want to give us victory. It's that truly we don't want it. Because we want to have our cake and eat it too. We want to find the loophole, which is why modern Christianity is so adamant about that God loves you so much that he will do anything to save you into, into his kingdom. That's not true. God has standards, and so should we. And he's already done all that he's going to do. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so James chapter 2, verse 12. Yeah, but no here for First John 5, verse 15. First John 5, verse 3, say, And if we know that he hears us, that is, that God hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desire of him. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death, I do not say he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, sin and there is a sin not unto death. I had kind of decided to skip over that because I didn't want to go into explaining <laughs> exactly what this portion of scripture is saying. But now that we have ruffled the feather, we have to smooth them back out, right? So 1 John chapter 5, 15 and 16 tells us that if we see our brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, we can pray for him and God will forgive him. This is something that when I first read it in the Bible, I thought it was a misprint because I had never heard anyone mentioned this in the church before all i've heard from my entire christian life is that the person who sin has to repent before they can be forgiven that's not what this is saying this is saying that if i see him sin a sin which is not unto death i can pray for him and god will forgive, forgive him all right so that's the power that god has put into our hands as intercessors and i guess that's why jesus while he was here would say your sins be forgiven that's a bit broad because when Jesus said that he was forgiven all, all the sins, including the ones unto death. So that's kind of outside. But uh, let me see if I can see an example from the Bible where if you read through the letters of Paul, you'll always see Paul praying for the church and praying for their sins. But as I said, I didn't want to go through this, but we have to deal with it. Um, you have to just go read the, read the book, see what 1 John chapter 5, verse 15 and 16 says for yourself, and understand that you have the power to pray for your brother when he's in a sin that is not unto death. I think perhaps one of the reasons why he chose it was in verse 17, where it says, All unrighteousness is sin. Yeah, but once you ruffle the feathers, you can't just walk away from it. So, I see my brother steal something. I can pray for him and God will forgive him for stealing because stealing is not a sin unto death. So, what do you mean um, by sin unto death? Hold, hold on, there. one thing at a time. Now, once I pray for him and God forgives him, I still have a responsibility to both, to both him and to God. And what is that responsibility? To tell him of his sin. I have to still go to him and let him know where he is 
I still have to admonish him because the Bible tells me that if I suffer my brother to live in sin, then it's because I hate him. That's from Deuteronomy, I think. One of the five books of Moses. It will be up on the screen. So what is a sin unto death? A sin unto death is very simple. It's all the sins in the Bible for which God prescribed death. For example, adultery. The penalty for adultery was? To be stoned. To be stoned to death. The penalty for murder. The penalty for blasphemy and for idolatry. Breaking the Sabbath. Br- breaking the Sabbath. All those things are sins unto death. death. Alright, so if that's one of the sins, we don't have the power to pray and God forgives it. Right there, the only option that we have is to go to our brother and to let him know so that he can repent and be forgiven or he can resist and stay in his sin and then at least our hands are clean. That's what that verse meant and that's why I wanted to skip over it. So let's go to verse 12, um, James chapter 2 verse 12. James chapter 2 verse 12 reads, So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. Okay, so I don't know why we didn't separate these two verses, because there's so much that's been said here. So let's deal with verse 12. Verse 12 says, So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. So whatever you say you should do. They should act according to the way you speak. Right. Your sermon should match your, your lifestyle. I remember we dealt with the law of liberty the last time, and the law of liberty is what we know as the law of love. The law of love is what we know as the Bible. In the entire Bible, God is trying to teach us two lessons. Love him with all our hearts, our mind, our soul, our strength, our being, and Love each other as we love ourselves. That's the law of liberty. And verse 13, For he shall have judgment without mercy that had showed no mercy. Remember in the, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said that if you see a beam in your brother's eyes, and Matthew what he was... Six. Huh? Matthew 6. Matthew 6. And what he was saying there, that if you see the speck in your brother's eyes, you're supposed to tell him. Okay? But before you do it, you have to make sure that you're not doing it with ulterior motives. And he says that the way you approach your brother, the way you treat your brother when he falls, is the same way that God will treat you when you fall. Which is why he says, with the measure that you met, it will be measured to you again. The way that you judge, God will also turn around and judge you in the very same way. And this is something that is repeated right through the Bible. Remember David, when David sinned with Bathsheba and Nathan came to him? And Nathan told him the story, and David was so incensed, David jumped up and David shouted, That man will surely die. And what does the prophet tell him? That's you. You are the man. And when David saw his own condemnation, David fell on his face and cried like a baby. But that's the whole thing, is that this is saying that however we act towards others is the same way God will act towards us. Verse 13, for he shall have judgment without mercy that had showed no mercy. If you are not merciful to others, God will not be merciful to you. That's why he says in the Lord's Prayer, as you forgive, he'll forgive you. Well, that particular part of the Lord's Prayer, I tell people to be very careful when they repeat that Lord's Prayer because there's a lot of things in there that we say that we don't mean. And the main one is the condition that we put on, on, on God's forgiveness because we have told God in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins even as we forgive others. So we're telling God, God, in the same way, in the same way use our behavior as a standard for acting towards us. And I tell people, be careful when you ask that. So, for example, when I teach that, I tell people you need to change those wording for now until you fall in line with what Christ had in mind for us. Because once you become a Christian, then you can pray that prayer. Yeah, you can, well, you can say, help me to. Right. <laughs> and so I tell him, you change it, you know, say, Lord, forgive me, even as you would have me forgive others. You know, put it back on God. Put it back on his standard. Remember when David was given three options for his sin, when he numbered Israel, God said, you have three options. You can have a famine for three years, I think. 
you can flee from your enemy for three months or something like that, or you can have pestilence for three days. The severity coming down from longer time, less severe, medium time, medium severity, short time, high severity. And David's response to God was that David didn't want to choose. David said what? Let me fall into the hands of the Lord. Right, let me fall into the hands of, of, of the Lord because the Lord is merciful. merciful. Coming back to the mercy that we have here. I say here, the last part, and mercy rejoices against judgment or mercy rejoices over judgment. So if we go to Micah the 6 verse 8, it mm-hmm. says, What has God desire of you, O man, but to... Do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. God's standard for us is that we must do justly. Meaning, God is saying that your minimum standard in any situation that I put you in is for you to do what's right. That's do justly. But he said you should love mercy. And the difference between doing justly and loving mercy is that you do what you have to do, but what you love, you will seek out and you find occasions to do. And he's saying that if you love mercy more than you love justice, what you will do is that even when people offend you, you will find a way to show them mercy. Forgive them. Okay? Not, not just, not, but, but it is no mercy, bro. Mercy is not just forgiveness. Mercy is a lot more. Mercy includes forgiveness and restoration. Mm-hmm. Okay? So, that's what God wants from us. God wants us to love mercy so much that whenever we have a choice between justice, judgment, and mercy, We choose mercy because mercy rejoice over justice. Uh, In in that verse, he's saying that the way you act towards another should always be just. Yeah. But the way you respond to how someone acts towards you should always be with an attitude of mercy. So, if okay, you're hungry, I am to feed you. But when I'm hungry, you don't feed me. You just eat. And you don't give me, I am supposed to for, to forgive you, not hold it against you. But okay. in, in that context, but continue to, to okay. do what is right on, on your behalf. All right, so let's deal with that. Whenever God tells us to do something, we shouldn't put people's behavior towards us in the equation. Because whenever we do that, we get ourselves in a great But that's area. what mercy, you can't have yeah. mercy oh, without. Well, hold on, let me... Let me Remember, remember when it says that the husband ought to love his wife and the wife ought to respect her husband. Those are admonitions being given to the two spouses. Right. If the spouse then look not on what God had told them to do, but on what God had told the other person to do, there's going to be problems in that house. Because you're always going to be judging your spouse, saying that they're not doing what God told them to do. You're not respecting me. Oh, you are, you are not loving me. But if we concentrate on what God has told us to do, which is for me to love my wife, then whether or not my wife is behaving or God told her to behave, I am too busy loving her. You right. Get me? So the example that I gave still has to do with the one person. Okay, it's my action towards another and my response towards how somebody else acts towards me. So the responsibility in both situations is mine. Mine right. to do justly and mine to give mercy. Right, right. But you can remove all that distinction that you just put and say whatever the situation, whether it's someone acting towards me or me acting towards someone else, this is my standard. The least I can do is do what's right. But what I want to do and what I love to do is be merciful and to go above and beyond just to be a minimum. I guess the, the distinction comes in that you could retaliate and still be just, but God doesn't want you to retaliate. He wants you to still be loving and kind. Right. So that's where the mercy comes in. So, for example, if you stole money from me, it would be the just thing for me to turn you into the authorities. Okay. But... I can choose not to do that, show mercy so that you can go work, find a job and pay me back if you want to or not. Okay. All right. So there we have it, is that whether we are acting or being acted upon, that's our standard. That's the way we behave. 
And, you know, one other thing I was sharing with those guys in, in prison the other day was that in the Christian life, and in, in any, in this, actually, this has nothing to do with Christianity. This has to do with any religion that, that, you, that you can think of, any financial freedom, um, personal freedom, is that you increase by divesting yourself of things. Not by acquiring things, but by divesting your thing, yourself of things. And if we should go through life and we understand that, okay, I'm going to limit my response and my behavior to what is said here. That I'm always going to do what's right, but I'm only going to do what's right when I can do what's exceptional, which is merciful, right? So if I can't be merciful, the minimum that I'll do is what's right. Which is why when you use the word just now, retaliate, retaliate doesn't come into it because retaliate has a more vengeful notion about it. Okay, well maybe that was the right <laughs> word. Right. So that's what we want to get out of this verse is that our behavior is within a slot. Okay? It's within a slot. So the minimum is justice. The maximum is mercy because we can't we can't go beyond mercy. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. All right, because you know one of the things that Jesus has told us: be be merciful, even as your God is merciful. Mm -hmm. So it's impossible for us to go beyond mercy, but that's our desire. And if we can't get to mercy, at least we we don't go beyond doing what's just. Okay, so let's look at Mark four twenty four. Mark 4, 24 reads, And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye mate, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. For he that hath to him shall be given. And he that hath not from him shall be taken even that which he hath. Okay. And so what Jesus is saying here is that if we use the right standard in our interaction with others, then... God will bless us because he will give us more. And remember, if you go back to the Old Testament, if you go back to the Torah, when the law was given, one of the main things that God kept reiterating several times is you should have one law. For both the stranger and yourself. Right, for both the strangers and those who are born in the land, for both the Israelites and the Gentiles. One law. That's what he's coming back here and he's, he's reiterating Go ahead now, First Peter 4, verse 8. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sin. Okay, so here we have charity. Charity is mercy. Sin is the offense, right? And so when someone sin against us, we can enact justice, which as you mentioned, if you steal myself, I can call the cops, and that's not a sin. That's just justice. But we can... We can have fervent charity, fervent love, fervent mercy, and that way we will overlook your crime because we're trying to save your soul. Proverbs 28, verse 13. He that covers his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confess and forsake them shall have mercy. Okay, so here's how this verse works now. And some of us are not going to like this. This has nothing to do with God. Okay, we might think that he's talking about telling God. God already knows. So even though we try to hide our sins from God and pretend that God doesn't know, no, God already knows. But let me chat a little bit further. When we offend each other, when we sin against each other, we shouldn't cover it up. Shouldn't try to hide right? It. We shouldn't hide it. What we should do is confess and forsake them. Right? So we should go to each other and we should what? apologize, say we are sorry, try to make offense, right? And that way we'll have mercy. And even if we don't get mercy from the person, we will get mercy from God. From God. Because God loves to see when we own up to what we do and try to fix it. Okay? And one of the reasons why we would go and we confess our sins to the person that we are offended is because we love the person even as we love ourselves. So we did, we did something, we come back, we realize that it was alright, and we go to the person and we have to say, hey, listen, 
I did you, I did you wrong. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> I was on the sideline watching some young guys play soccer, and one of the guys went in the goal, and this guy took a thunderous shot, and the guy in the goal blocked it, but then blocking it, he hurt his hand. So he asked me to play for him, and you know, so, so he could come off and tend to the pain. And I was playing and playing and playing, and I forgot that this guy had given me the game. So the next week when I went back, I saw him. I said, hey, by, by the way, I need to apologize to you. And he said, what for? I said, oh, remember the other day you gave me a game? Um, and I acted like an ass that I should have given back your game. And he was like, what are you talking about? I said, remember the day when you hurt your hand? And he was like, oh, yeah, I remember. And I said, yeah, I, I should have given back your game as soon as your, your hand stopped hurting you. And he was like, oh, don't no, forget about it. Forget about it. I didn't even remember. But guess what? I've gained a friend. And it's the same thing we know with, with each with each other as Christian in the church where we have to deal with each other constantly, week after week. But we have to get this down as as soon as we realize that we've offended each other, we should be Christian enough to apologize. Proverbs ten twelve. Hatred stirreth up strife, but love covereth all sin. Right. And again we see love doing what? Covering, Covering over the sin. And this is what love does. The covering means forgiving. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't mean hiding. It means... Now, here, here's how it goes. God says that whatever sin we hold, and he was talking to the church, a little bit different context, but it still applies somewhat to, to, to us as individuals. He said whatever sin we remit on earth will be remitted in heaven. And this is what it means. If I sin against you and I come and I apologize and you forgive me, God automatically forgive me, even if I didn't ask him for forgiveness. You get that? Because mm -hmm. God is certainly bigger than you. All right. So we're willing to forgive than I am. <laughs> so James chapter two verse fourteen. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food. And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, and be warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What does it profit? So, the first thing we have to understand here is that James is not saying that we shouldn't share the gospel with a hunger person, or that a person that is in need. It would be like double jeopardy for a person who is suffering in this life, if we don't share the gospel with them because we can't bear their need. And then not only do they suffer in this life, but they suffer in their life to come because we thought that we had to fill their needs before we share the gospel. All right? So this is not saying that we shouldn't share the gospel to those who are suffering. You know, after all, when Peter and John were walking and they saw the man by the gate beautiful begging, what did they do? They didn't say, well, we have no money, so we can't help him. But he said, what, brother, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto you, rise up and walk. Now, we might not be able to tell a man, rise up and walk. We can, but that's a different story. So we can't tell a man to rise up and walk. But we can tell a man, live. We can tell a man, live forever. We can tell a man, go to heaven. I think that brings us back to verse 12 when he says, so, so speak ye, so do. So if you're telling people about this love, you must also demonstrate that love. Right, right. And that's what it's talking about, is that if you can both tell someone about faith and feed them, that's good. But if you can't feed them, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't tell them about, right. about Christ, right? If we can tell them about Christ and feed them, excellent. But if we can only do one, just do the one year that you can do. Okay, so verse 17 say, Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. This is not a rebuttal of Paul in, for example, Ephesians 2 verse 9 and Galatians 2 verse 16, where Paul says what? It is not by works, but by faith, right? So, so not contradicting. Martin Luther wanted to exclude the book of James from the Bible. Because he thought that James was contradicting Paul when Paul says we are saved not by work but by faith. faith. And so he wanted to exclude James because he didn't understand that these guys were saying the exact same thing. Now let me explain what is going on 
between Paul and James. They are not in a debate. They are not addressing each other. Right. Paul is dealing with some guys who are trying to work their way into heaven. If you remember in Galatians, he came back to them and said, how are you so quickly turned away from the faith that you first heard about? I know you're going back into Judaism, trying to, to, gain, your salvation. to gain your salvation to obey the law. So he has these guys who are trying to work their way into heaven, and he's saying, stop, 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 you got this all wrong. All you need to get into heaven is faith. And so he's correcting them by telling them, listen, it's not through work that you get to heaven, but it's through faith. Now James is over here, and James have a different set of guys, right? James have a different set of guys. These guys over here are saying that, what? Well, hey, listen, we don't have to do anything, because we have faith. So all we have to do is just live however we want, because God loves us, and we're going to get into heaven, right? And you hear that quite a bit. You know, they're taking it from one extreme to the other. Either you're trying to work your way into he into heaven, or you are not doing any of what God told you to do. Right. So, you know, we have to find the balance. We are not saved by works, but because we are saved, we do the work that God has called us to do. Right. And so, James now is telling them, listen, sitting around on your doofus all day, talking about your faith, isn't going to help you or anybody else. Your faith, in order to be faith, needs work. In other words, it needs an expression. It needs to be it's like me it. saying that I'm a great artist, but I have never picked up a paintbrush. <laughs> no, in order for me to be a great artist, not only must I believe faith, but I must pick up the paintbrush and paint work. Even so, faith, if it does not have work, is dead because it is alone. It's not proven. Right. Now let's look at verse 18. Yeah. A man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy work, and I will show my faith by my works. Okay. Now, one of the things that this verse should remind us of is the story with Jesus when they let down the man through the roof. You remember that? Mm -hmm. The paraplegic man? Mm -hmm. And when they let down the man through the roof, what did Jesus do? Jesus but said, no Thy sin be forgiven thee. You remember that? Yeah, that's what he said. They let down this man. This man's a cripple, paraplegic. He's there lying on the ground. Jesus looks around and then he looks, he sees the faith that his friends had. And Jesus smiles and Jesus says to the man, Thy sins be forgiven thee. And what do the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law do? This man is blaspheming. Jesus now turns to them and he says, Which is easier, for me to tell this man that his sin is forgiven or for me to tell him Rise up and walk. Well, which is easier? Well, if I tell you your sins are forgiven, you, you, there's no proof. Right, I don't have to prove it. It's easier. But if I tell him, rise up and walk, then he better be able to walk. He better jump up and walk. And then Jesus says, rise up and walk. The man jumps up and runs through the door. The first one, thy sin be forgiven thee, didn't require any. That's answer. faith. But if your faith can't produce work, which I'm going to prove that I have faith because when I tell him, rise up and walk, he's going to do what I say. And so Jesus demonstrated two of them coming together. And that is what James is saying here now, is that if you have faith, you will have work. Because we have been saved unto work. good work. James is so, so funny because James say, hey, listen, if you say you have faith, let's have a competition. That's what he's saying here. Let's have a competition. Let's, let's have a contest. You show me your faith by doing no work, and I'm going to show you my faith by doing some work, and you tell me which one of us have faith. And so he's saying that if your faith does not produce work, it's because your faith is false. is false. When we believe what God has offered us, it will produce the work of salvation in our lives. We will want to see others saved. And even if we are in, we're not good at explaining and telling people about Jesus, we won't be able to stop ourselves because it produces this unction in us to do the work of salvation, which is go ye into all the world teaching. Okay? Verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Okay. 
So believing, having faith that there is one God is neither here nor there. Because there are many others who believe the same thing who are not saved and will never be saved. And the devils do what? The devils believe and they tremble. They believe and they react. You see that? They're afraid of God. Yeah, but they're still rebelling. But they're still in rebellion. And so he's saying that just believing that there is one God is congratulations. You're just like everybody else. Now go on. Verse 20. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Okay, now let's jump down to Romans 4, verse 1 to 4. Romans 4, 1 to 4, and then we are going to discuss this. What shall we say then, that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, had found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he had whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of death. So Paul is saying that the big thing is faith right here because Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness. James is saying that the faith that Abraham has produced work because Abraham offered Isaac. Alright, this again is not, is not an attack against each other. This is not in contradiction. Let me explain what both of them mean. At a time when the Bible says that Abraham believed God and God counted for him for righteousness, what were they doing? What was Abraham and God doing at the time? God was calling out Abraham to, to become a people for him. Mm -mm. God was testing him, mm -mm. having him prove his faith. No, not yet. At a time when God, when the Bible says that, that Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness is when God told him that he was going to have a son. Okay. Okay? When God told him that he was going to have a son, the Bible says he believed. Anyway, he, he had complained to God that he, God had given all, him all this stuff, but Eliezer, one of his servants, is going to inherit it because he doesn't have a son from his own body. God promised him a son, and Abraham believed God, and God counted that belief to be righteousness. Okay. Okay? Now, so you, there was no works that produced. There's no, there's no works. He just believed God that God is going to do what God said and he's going to have a son. Years passed and he has the son that God promised him and then God came to him and said, offer your only son as a burnt sacrifice. But there was more to the promise than just Isaac. There was more to the promise because Isaac would produce a multitude of people. Okay. So, he also believed about the multitude of people. Okay. Even though he believed God, when God commanded him to sacrifice Isaac, in our rational way of thinking, that would be sacrificing the multitude of people that was promised. So, he had to be exercising faith to carry out what the command was. Okay, so what is the relationship between the two? There's two verses that we are dealing with, both of which says that this is how Abraham right. so Abraham, was faithful. Abraham, for example, was saved because he believed God okay. in initially. And because he believed God initially, he was able to, to work, to do what God tells him to do, based on his belief in what God had already told him. Right. Okay, so let's, let's sum it up. God promised Abraham a son, and from this son, there would be a nation, and that nation would inherit the land that God sent him into. That's the full scope of the promise, right? Okay, he now has this son, young man, and God comes to him, and God says, sacrifice the boy. And James here says, was not Abraham our father justified by works? And yes, he was, and this is how he was justified. Because God tested him with the same thing that he had the faith in. So God says, I promise you a son. And God didn't explain this to him. God just simply told him, sacrifice the boy. But God had promised him a son that would produce a nation that would inherit the land. God now comes and God says, sacrifice the boy. And Abraham, because he believed that God would give him a son, 
that will produce a nation that will inherit a land, Abraham went ahead to sacrifice the boy, even though sacrificing the boy seemingly jeopardized the promise. Because what Abraham was relying on was not just the promise, but God. Right. And that's evident in Abraham when Abraham said, God will provide himself a lamb. When the boy asked him, where's the lamb? Even though he knew what he was about to do, okay. he still was relying on God. Hey, like um, Charles Stanley always says, obey God and leave the consequences to him. Right. Let, let him work it out. All right. But let's look at this in the fashion that it was unfolded in Abraham's mind. Because not every time that a man speaks prophecy, a man knows that he's prophesying. That's true. So, for example, Caiaphas said that Jesus must die for the nation. Mm-hmm. But he wasn't talking about it in the way that it, was it, it unfolded. Mm-hmm. He was just talking in his selfish realm. So Abraham, when Abraham is going, there's a couple of things that happen. Abraham has two, and we'll stop here right after I explain this. Abraham has two servants going with him, right? So he, t- he took the boy, and he took two servants. When he came with him inside of Mount Moriah, he told the two servants to wait here and the boy are, are going to go sacrifice and we'll come back. And people look at that and they say, see, Abraham knew that they were going to come back. No, Abraham told the two servants to wait because if he told the two servants what he was going to do, they would have stopped the whole man because obviously he has lost his mind. Just as though Jesus' mother and brothers came to stop him in his ministry because he says he is totally cuckoo. Right? So they're not doing it because they hate him, they're doing it because they love him. In the same way, Abraham's servants, because they know Abraham, how much Abraham loved this boy, they told her that Abraham was going to sacrifice the boy, they would have stopped him. They were a hog time and dragged him back to Sarah. So he told them, you guys wait here, we're going to go up to our sacrifice and we'll go right back. Right. Then he's going up now with just him and the boy. Yeah, the boy has the wood on his shoulder, Abraham has a torch in his hand, they're walking up the hill, then... All of a sudden, it occurred to Isaac, oh, wait a minute. Where's the sacrifice? (laughs) Where's the the goat? Where's the sacrifice? So he turns to his brother and says, Dad, I have the wood. You have the fire. Where's the lamb? If Abraham told the boy at that point, son, you're the lamb, then even as much as Isaac loved his father and wanted to do what pleased him, he would have too much time and too much, a heavier burden to take the rest of the journey. Because with each step, the devil would start playing tricks with him. So what does he say? God will provide himself a lamb. Now catch this. Again, he's prophesying, but he doesn't know what he's prophesying. He's just placating his son. Mm-hmm. He's just giving his son an answer so that the boy's mind will be eased until when this time we're telling that hey listen he did provide a lamb and you're the lamb right so he says to the boy god and god will provide himself a lamb which in so many ways is a prophecy and so the boy is now content he now goes up to the top of the hill when they reach the top of the hill what do they do they build an altar together then he takes the wood and he puts it on top and at that point he tells isaac isaac you're the lamb god told me to sacrifice you what does Isaac do? He allows himself to be rounded. Isaac allows his father to tie his hand and put him on top of the altar. Just as about 3,000 years later, Jesus on the top of the same hill will allow himself to be bound and to be placed on top of the wood. But the reason why Isaac lay down on the wood was because he loved his father. But if he had time to think about it, he probably would have come to a different conclusion on his trip up. Just as on Jesus, on his trip up to Mount Moriah, what did he do? He stopped and he begged his father three times not to do this. Now imagine if Isaac had turned to Abraham and started begging Abraham all the way up. Daddy, don't do this. Daddy, don't do this. And Abraham might not have. He might not have done it. And so... Okay, so we'll pick up this study right here next time. We'll pick it up at verse 20, and we will finish up reiterating and finish up this act of Abraham that justified him. Because this was a necessary part, and this is something that God will do for each and every one of us. 
even though we have faith and we have accepted Jesus Christ and we are saved, God will test our resolve. May God bless and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Until we meet again, walk with God. Goodbye.